Hemorrhagic rhinitis represents a global health concern where it affects approximately 400 million people worldwide. The prevalence of allergic rhinitis has increased over the years along with increased urbanization and environmental pollutants thought to be some of the leading causes of the disease. It is reported to affect approximately 25 to 40% of children and adults globally respectively. Approximately 80% of allergic rhinitis symptoms develop before the age of 20 years and peak at the age 20 to 40 years before gradually declining. So hello everyone, welcome to our podcast series on healthcare. Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Narmada Ashok, Distinguished Consultant Pediatrician and a Director at Nalam Medical Center. Dr. Narmada is known for her extensive expertise in pediatrics, asthma care, and educational activities. She has over two decades of experience and her objective is to practice ethically and make a mark in academics. And today she will share her expertise on managing allergic rhinitis, shedding light on this global health concern. Dr. Narmada, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us and share your insights with our audience. Thank you for those kind words, Dr. Harshita. It's been a pleasure uh, joining you. And as uh, it goes, I'm always very keen in discussing about the health related topics. And I'm very happy for the opportunity today uh, to discuss with this uh, with you with this very, very important topic on allergic rhinitis. Asthma, I'm sure everybody knows. But then when it comes to allergic rhinitis, the same asthma patients who will have coexist in allergic rhinitis, they don't really control that symptoms. So that might be the reason for the exacerbation of asthma or other allergic disorders also. I'm happy that we'll be discussing about the same today here. Yes, great doctor. And now before we delve into our discussion on management of allergic rhinitis, could you start by sharing with us a bit about your clinical journey and the experience you have gained along the way? Yeah, I actually completed my postgrads in about 2003 and from then on, um, from 2008, I have been into this allergic and asthma uh, uh, immunology section and uh, uh, I did my uh, diploma in the same in from uh, Christian Medical College, Bellore. And uh, basically, I'm working as a consultant pediatrician at Nalam Medical Center, which is my own concern in Bellore. And uh, because of that, I had a very close association with the department uh, in allergy and asthma in CMCM and I'm going as a faculty for the uh, same uh, course as well as I'm also have trained multiple allergy specialists across the nation today. So this was a program that I started in 2008 and it's running very strong though there are many such courses and this is one of the courses which is much acclaimed all over uh, internationally. So I've been happy to be associated with uh, similar courses across the nation as well as also internationally. Uh, having uh, said that, I'm also very keen in uh, the general pediatric practice also and anything that concerns with the welfare of the children. And uh, so that's how and I've been uh, holding various posts in Indian Academy of Pediatrics. And right now I'm the president of Indian Medical Association. So what got me into the associations is also a keen interest to uh, en enroll myself with the uh, community health. I think that's where the uh, basis of why we took up uh, medicine really stands. So I'm happy to be there. So this is my journey of into my profession. That's great to hear, Doctor, and it's very inspiring. And uh, now let's uh, shift our focus to allergic rhinitis, a condition yeah. that affects many individuals globally. So how can healthcare providers accurately diagnose allergic rhinitis and what are the key indicators they should consider? See, allergic rhinitis basically comes with uh, nasal discharge or a nasal stuffiness, uh, predominantly continuous sneezing that occurs most commonly in the early morning or uh, you know predominantly the patient is when it is exposed to some dusty environment or when they're going for out on a traffic or some atmospheres which doesn't suit them they will have a continuous sneezing they may have coexistent headaches also that is allergic sinusitis they may have coexistent watering of the eyes that is allergic rhinoconjunctivitis what we call now allergic rhinitis is actually considered as a comorbid feature that is a coexistent feature of asthma also we don't ask specifically the question whenever the patient comes with asthma they come very easily because they have a disturbing nighttime cough or they have difficulty in breathing and they will not be outright about the symptoms of allergic rhinitis and when you ask them is are they having any nasal 
itchy or stuffiness they will then say yes yes i do have it but it's okay but it is not actually okay so it's a very big comorbid feature along with asthma so these are the nasal stuffiness nasal itchiness sneezing are the commonest uh, features go uh, are the commonest diagnostic criteria for allergic rhinitis yeah thank you for uh, shedding light on the diagnostic process and dr narmada and now let's talk about uh, treatment options so how do intranasal corticosteroids contribute to the management of allergic rhinitis and what are the potential benefits and the side effects associated with their use so basically if you look at it allergic rhinitis uh, the s- symptoms are because of the allergic reaction whenever the allergen enters into the body which is an innocuous product for everybody else but for this particular patient it starts a very cycle of uh, inflammatory markers so uh, that is there will be some release of cyt- chemicals in the body in our terms it is cytokines and interleukins which leads to the production of histamines leukotrienes multiple other chemicals that contributes to the symptoms which you are seeing in allergic rhinitis like nasal stuffiness itchy and all that so basically intranasal corticosteroids has an effect on those inflammation you have the ige antibody that sits on the mast cells okay so whenever the antigen comes there is a cross linking of this ige it is like a gateway it opens up a gateway and the chemicals are flooded in our system when it happens in the nasal area we call it as allergic rhinitis when the same thing happens in the lower respiratory tract it leads to asthma intranasal steroids actually um as um, it stops the allergic reactions from happen there is a stabilization that occurs in the after the receptors are activated so that the release of the leukotrienes the the histamines is prevented so that is how the intranasal steroids actually has a stoppage on the on the disease process the disease doesn't get modified but the symptoms of the same are uh, really relieved so this this is how we are it's an anti inflammation steroids are anti inflammatory so generally in all allergic disorders this is what is happening and that is an inflammatory pro inflammatory uh, status in the entire body so this actual uh, when we are giving using a steroid we are giving an anti inflammatory uh, uh, drugs for the same but if you are going to give some oral medicines what happens is you are going to uh, the medicines has to enter the body work on and then goes to the particular area but here we know where is the process happening what is the problem it has happening in the nasal epithelium so we are giving intra nasal steroids directly in the area where it, uh, it is needed so the dosage is also very much less so this is uh, so steroid is acting as an anti inflammatory agent stabilizing the medicine so that we have an effect on the drugs and mm-hmm. then it is uh, we are using it in the area where the inflammation occurs now the coming to the side effect of it when we are using uh, you know whenever they have nasal stuffiness or when they have this itchiness they tend to use some uh, drops which are like vasodilators you know oxymetazole and these side of a drops these are all can cause a rebound phenomenon whereas a steroid does not have any of those side effect and when you are using an intranasal steroid we are going to use very less quantity only like the dosage which is used is to the tune of 100 to 200 micrograms so there doesn't it doesn't affect your systemic manifestation so steroid given in the localized form in that area does not have any side effects having said that if you are having a diabetes or if the total dosage of your intranasal steroid is combined because if you will have asthma right so if you have a coexistent asthma and if you are taking inhalant medication for the asthma also if the total dosage is exceeding 800 microgram per day then the patient might have some systemic complication so it is up to the doctor to find out how much is the dosage is and then you we will actually then look into why the patient is requiring such a high doses Uh, is the symptoms are not under control or it is definitely an atopic asthma should we try some other methods uh, or some other means in order to reduce the steroid dosage but this dosage of 800 microgram is used in very 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 small set of patients only so the steroid uh, i would say the dosage unless until it exceeds this daily dosage it doesn't really create any side effects Okay that's insightful Dr Narmada and now moving on uh, when is oral antihistamine therapy such as cetirizine uh, recommended for treating allergic rhinitis and how does it compare to other treatment options in terms of efficacy and safety yeah cetirizine again it is just an uh, simple it is it gives you the symptomatic relief 
you're having the sneezing right you're having the rhinorrhea so patient wants to get the immediate relief the antihistamines are used so the antihistamines are uh, you see you have in an asthma management or allergic disorders management you have something called as a reliever medication and you have something called as a preventar medication preventar is something you do it prevents you from completely getting the symptoms right completely so that will take some time to act because the steroid has to go and stabilize the agents and everything so in between the child patient is having severe symptoms like is having continuous sneezing there are patients who keep uh, sneezing 100 times in a day so they are not comfortable you know and they develop this itchiness they block their their daily life is disturbed then you would want to give uh, antihistamine because antihistamine is as i told you histamine is one of the chemicals that is released when the antigen sits on the mast cell so it, it is a reliever medication immediately the effect is almost immediate whether it is within a half an hour but you don't want to use it on a very longer time also so you would try to uh, keep it for a very short period maybe 10 days maximum 14 days and then meanwhile your steroid acts so you try to taper up the dosage of the you increase the dosage of steroid or you adjust the dosage so that the patient is symptomatically uh, is relieved completely is prevented from getting the symptoms also so antihistamines acts as a symptom relief as an acute agent whereas you don't want to get the symptoms at uh, not all you are using the in nasal steroids and again cetrazine uh, is one of the second generation antihistamine that is not having a least sedative action but you need to take it twice daily there are drugs which is given uh, they are also least sedative given once a day dosage that depends on the patients how they are comfortable they want and uh, there are uh, certain agents which are the first generation antihistamines preferably we don't use that because they are very sedative and you cannot drive the cars but every one of us have a individual tolerance to these medicines yeah. some people even with cetrazine they st- they sleep for a very long periods so that time we prefer a completely non sedative one so it depends so it is very individualized so uh, now uh, i would like to delve deeper into specific medications so what considerations uh, should be made when uh, prescribing levocetrazine for allergic rhinitis and how does it differ from other second generation antihistamines like effects of phenardine in terms of uh, pharmacokinetics and adverse effects um with regard to the uh, levocetrazine is uh, relatively safer that's what we say mm-hmm. and the dosage is when you compare to cetrazine it's almost half the dosage and it is supposed to be uh, a drug that is having a least sedative action compared to that of the first generation antihistamine now but the problem it is got a shorter duration of action not not very short it's like about 12 hours or so whereas the fexofenadine has got a very longer duration of action in the case of 18 to 24 hours so based on efficacy there are lot lot the studies has been done with uh, levocetrazine compared to that of the fexofenadine but uh, nowadays it's almost like comparative drug only as i said uh, the consideration in both the cases are whether you want the re- immediate relief of symptoms and how comfortable the patient is with the the drug they are using now if some they don't have sedation with levocetrazine itself then we have studies that is backing up the efficacy of levocetrazine so we would use it with regard to fexofenadine the studies are less but still patient is responding well to it or he is having a sedative effect with the levocetrazine itself and he is very comfortable with once a day dosage then i would prefer the fexofenadine so the efficacy wise both are acting as a um, reliever medications and the it depends very individualistic on how, how fast you uh, the patient responds to these medicines to get relieved of their symptoms that's very informative dr narmada and uh, now uh, when do you prefer combination therapy over monotherapy in the management of allergic rhinitis yeah you mean the combination with montelukast with uh, the levocetrazine combination right so you need to understand that the pharmacokinetics of montelukast is different from that of the levocetrazine montelukast again is a mast cell stabilizing agent as i told you it sits on the uh, anti leukotrienes again anti histamines is one cycle anti leukotrienes in the mast cell stabilizers are there these are all different thing and when you uh, uh, the anti leukotrienes is montelukast is one uh, type so here the combining it with the, the montelukast it's a like once a day dosage for montelukast the pharmacokinetics are way different from that of a levocetrazine when you do twice a day dosage uh, we don't actually want to combine both there is no effect with the dosage okay. so ideal is to give the montelukast separately and again to separate uh, the antihistamines combination 
and then until you estimates you want it as a very short duration only i don't want to keep it for a longer period whereas there are people who respond better to montelukast and they will use it for a little three months also mm-hmm. again in allergic rhinitis uh, there are varying thoughts that uh, there are there is an fda black box warning with regard to neuropsychiatric disturbances of montelukast in children also so intranasal steroids has got a very less side effects when compared to both these agents i don't want to use mm-hmm. them for a longer period use combination and don't use it for a longer period yeah thank you for sharing your insights dr narmada and finally uh, how do nasal decongestants complement the treatment of allergic rhinitis and what precautions should be taken to avoid rebound congestion and other adverse effects there is no way you can avoid rebound congestion there is no, after you start using for four or five days you are bound to get oxymetazolin is going to produce a rebound congestion uh, so using this decongestant is very very short maybe you know you are in the op or you are in a work and you are suddenly getting a very severe nasal block you want to get relief for that particular moment maybe you know maybe that's it's like Uh, preferable is to avoid the decongestants probably they will use it for a viral uri when you're not getting a sleep or so but the problem is you have an addictive tendency to the oxymetazolin you get such an immediate relief that patient wants to use it continuously and as doctors we know that it leads to a lot of problem like re- uh, medicamentosa you have the continuous rhinitis which starts because of the medicines per se so better is to avoid have a proper treatment on have a proper diagnosis start on intranasal steroids adjust your dosage use the antihistamines for a short while and there are 40 percentage of the population who have a tendency to respond to montelukast much better than the thing in those of a those sort of a patients i would use it for a 3 months to 6 uh, months montelukast but of course in a younger child or a child who's having an autistic disorder or a seizure disorder i would definitely be little wary about using montelukast So we had a great session uh, Dr Narmada thank you so much for your invaluable insights and it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast today and learning from your expertise in the management of allergic rhinitis thank you thank you so much Dr Archita for this opportunity yeah and we look forward to having you back soon thanks my pleasure yeah and to our audience thank you for tuning in And if you are a healthcare professional and have any questions or would like to explore more topics in the world of medicine, don't forget to connect with us on the R Med Synapse platform. This platform is not just a resource; it's a dynamic space where you can connect with your medical peers, participate in meaningful discussions, and contribute to the ongoing evolution of healthcare. So until next time, take care and stay healthy. Goodbye.